Yeah, well, um, we've got a um, number of speakers. My name is Dr. Bishop Dale O'Hanlon. I am a lecturer in the Department of Applied Social Studies. Um, my main role there is um, I'm program director for the Masters in Bonnie and Clean Sector Management. I teach across a range of the different programs. If people can't hear me, you probably won't care because I'm not really <laughs> an important speaker. These are the important speakers. Uh, but my voice tends to drop, so I apologize about that. Um, to my right is Ben, uh, Ben Rakes. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Huddersfield. He qualified as a social worker in 1982. He's worked as a probation officer, a court welfare officer, and manager of a family mediation center prior to his current role. Um, and he's going to be the first speaker. Uh, the second speaker is going to be Shona. And Shona comes from Bosch University. <laughs> you like this one? Are you joking? Are you joking? <laughs> <laughs> After graduating from uh, St. Anne's College, Oxford, and Jewish students, Shona was called to the Bar of England and Wales and practiced criminal and family law. Um, her professional experience led her to research uh, in um, the intersection between family and criminal law. And she's going to speak second. And uh, the next person is Linda Moore who comes from the same university that I actually graduated from, although they've changed the name. I don't think it's anything to do with me graduating from it. But, oh, that's not <laughs> that. <laughs> but um, Linda Moore is a senior lecturer in criminology uh, and criminal justice at Ulster University, as it's now called. She's currently president of the University and College Union at Ulster. And prior to that, she was an investigation worker at the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. And she investigated conditions and breaches of rights in prison. Um, a lot of publications that she's published. Uh, I mentioned one, a co-author co with Phil Stratton, who's some of you may have heard of, who was famous in relation to the Hillsborough tragedy. And the book, that particular book, is called The Decautionaries of Women, uh, Punishing Bodies, Rape and Spirits, 2013, Just give her a plug. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe without further ado, we'll start off with Ben. Okay, thank you for that. And um, thank you to Ashling and to Fiona for giving me the chance to talk to you this afternoon. We talked earlier about how the most important thing is to hear children's voices in understanding the lived experience of children and prisoners. I've been very fortunate. I've had been involved in a number of different um, projects which have um, allowed me to talk to children directly about the impact of imprisonment upon them. And um, I suppose my presentation is a bit of a collage, really, of the different things I've heard. What I wanted to start off with was, um, and those who came to the COPE conference in Edinburgh will have heard this before, so apologies to them, but um, I wanted to start off with a young woman who I interviewed quite some time ago, in 2010 now, actually, and I was evaluating an amazing facility that exists in a women's open prison um, in York, um, in the north of England, and um, within that, there's a house which um, mothers can actually have their children come and stay with them for up to 48 hours. And those who know um, about this subject, which is everybody here, I'm sure, will know that um, a mother going to prison is um, far, far more disruptive, generally, than a father going to prison, for the general reason that, um, astonishingly, when mothers go to prison, only 9% of those children are cared for by their fathers only 5% of those children remain in their own homes. So 95% of children with a mother in prison will be living in a different home to where they were before the sentence. So I think that gives us pause for thought about how disruptive um, a mother going to prison is. And by contrast, if a dad goes to prison, 95% of children are looked after by their mothers. But what I wanted to do was to play this video, I'm sorry, not video, audio extract, because it was probably the most profound interview I've ever done in my career. Um, it was a young woman who was 19 at the time I interviewed her. Um, her mother was coming to the end of a life sentence and has since been released, but at the time when I interviewed her, her mother was serving the life sentence. So basically, she had her mother in prison from the age of seven to the age of 19. In fact, probably 20 by the time her mum was released. So her whole childhood, really, was her mum in prison. So this is her talking about the experiences that she had of visits. Now, in case you're wondering about confidentiality breaches, what, what it is, is the actual transcript, which I've edited, because it's about an hour and a half long, and this is only six minutes, you would let in. 
but also I, one of my colleagues who, by coincidence, um, had been an actor in her past, she's reading the transcript. So it's not the actual person reading it, but it is her words. Years. I was seven when my mum was sentenced, and I remember everything about it. The first time I visited my mum in prison, it wasn't that good because it was a closed prison. And obviously I didn't quite understand where I was going at first to visit. And there was a lot of security gates and searching. And I don't know, I got a bit funny about people being all around me. And I felt it wasn't private where I could talk. I felt pretty scared, I'd say, to go in at that age and visit mum. I just felt I didn't have a mum at that time. What I mean by that is because she wasn't there 24-7 every day. I just felt I didn't have one. And the only time I had a mum was when I come to visit, so it was hard. A lot of people used to say, where's your mum? And I didn't know what to say. I just used to say, I haven't got a mum, because that was the best thing for me to say. I found out about my mum going to prison myself through the TV and papers. I was told that she's gone away, she's working away to try and be an air stewardess, or I'd get mixed things from different people. Like some would say, oh, she's off working away. Some would say, she's been a bit naughty and she'd have to go away for a bit. Just some little things at that age that they thought I'd believe. And every Christmas they'd be like, oh yeah, maybe she'll be home this Christmas. And she just never came, so I just kind of blocked it out, like it was just an everyday routine, so I'd get on with it. I remember the first visit I ever, ever had, and mum was quite run down, you know, very depressed. And it looked like I was going to a really big Victorian old castle sort of thing. And that day it was really rainy and dark and really cloudy. I just thought, what is this tomb? What are we going into? The prison was really dark and dull and I felt quite claustrophobic. I remember being really upset because I didn't understand what was going on and why I was being taken away from her after like an hour or two. Every time I used to see her, I used to think, oh, she's coming back now, and she never did. I wouldn't want to let go of her hand, and sometimes the guard would just be like, you're going to have to go now, and it just broke my heart. I'd be clutching her finger, telling her, come on, let's go now, and she's like, I can't come, and I always used to say, why? Why, why? When I was 10, my mum told me everything, and I understood, and I have no judgment, no nothing, because she's my mum at the end of the day, and everyone can make a mistake and be pushed. Memories are so important. At one prison, we got the chance to have pictures taken, and there were memories of that day. I could have them on my wall so I could see them and think, she hasn't gone away, she's still there, she's not dead, she's still around. Yeah, photos mean a lot, and letters, but mainly photos where I could actually wake up and see her. So I used to wake up and see her and realise she's not gone. She's in my mind and she's here like physically, but she's not gone, she's still there. In one prison, we had some activities to focus on during the visit. If we were getting a bit upset, we could think, come on, we can do this. So it gets you from being out of that depressive thought of, oh, I've got to go soon. Because that's kind of what I think kids are thinking all the time when they come and see their mum. Because they think, oh, we've got to go soon, we've got to go soon. And the time feels like, I don't know, I know you might get an hour, maybe two, but it feels like five or ten minutes. In one prison, my mum was very, very unhappy there because she couldn't adapt to it. It seemed a lot stricter. I didn't like it, mainly because it was depressing my mum being there. You weren't allowed any physical contact on visits, apart from like a tap sort of thing. They were very, very strict, even though you'd been searched and whatnot, they wouldn't allow any physical contact. So I felt like I couldn't have that emotional connection with her, or that physical bond. I didn't like that. I know that every time I had to go and see her, I'd cry because it was just, it was just horrible. I didn't like that one at all. I really hated searching. The searching involved where you'd have to empty everything out of your pockets and put it in a locker and only take loose change for the canteen and you'd have to stand like a starfish and then they'd search one arm, then the other, then the legs, then the back, around your waist and just everywhere. And then you'd have to stand like a starfish again and a dog would come and sniff you. 
and you just felt really uncomfortable. And you're thinking, I know, I know that you've got to do it, but I wouldn't bring or do something like that. But I know it's on routine, so you've just got to grin and bear it. My advice to any child going to visit their mum on a closed visit would be just try to, not to think of it as really bad. Just try and enjoy the time you have with mum instead of what's going on around you. I remember once that I had a really, really rough time and I got allocated a very special visit where it could just be me and my mum in a room so we could have a really good chat because I was really depressed and it was either talk to her or do something stupid. That was a really horrific time for me. It made a huge difference because all I wanted was my mum and I needed to speak to my mum and I was sick and tired of waiting for a phone call and like just thinking, come on, ring me, ring me, because I need to talk to you. And that's the other thing, not being able to ring her. It's hard because sometimes I just need to speak to her because she's the only parent I have. My dad isn't around now and my granddad's gone. So there's no one really around that I'm close to, apart from my mum. And it's just, just to have that time made me feel like so much better. And made me go with a smile thinking, I can do this, I can get through this. Because I've had that one-to-one -one where no one got to listen. Because that's a big issue. When you're 16, I remember saying to her all the time, I just want to see you on your own. Because I don't feel like... If there's other people there, I don't feel like we can talk because you've got to entertain everyone, not just me. So I want a one-to-one -one and I got it. It made a huge difference because if I hadn't had that time, I don't think I'd be here now. So I think you'll agree that's very powerful material in terms of um, a child's, well, young young woman's view of um, having her mum in prison and the themes of um, the consequences of disclosure, which is dishonest, meant that she's there on the visits and she's clinging to her mum's hand. She doesn't understand why the visit has to end. She doesn't know where she is. And then she finds out anyway through the media. Um, the frustration of not being able to share the ups and downs of your life as a child with your parents spontaneously because parents ring in but children can't ring the prison so they can't you know by the, by the time they can talk to the parent perhaps that moment's lost um and um just the the the, the i suppose what comes through to me every time i listen to that is that um, the child's well-being is so linked to the parent's well-being so that if you see your mum or your dad and they're down and they're depressed, then you know, that is a terrible impact on you as a child. Um, and, and one of the things we learned, because I should have said as well, that um, I've also more recently been involved in a large-scale European project, which is, was called Coping, concluded in 2013. And we compared um, the experiences of children and prisoners um, in Sweden, Germany, Romania, and the UK. And what we heard across the board was that there was this, um, uh, on a visit, basically, almost it was almost like a charade sometimes, you know, the, the parent would say everything's fine, even though there's been a fight in the canteen, or they're really depressed, or, and then the child and the mother, or generally was mother, if it was a father being visited, they would say everything's fine, because the greatest gift was to kind of pretend everything was fine, because to actually break down in tears, when the bell's going to go and the visit's going to end is just horrendous because there's no time to finish anything. Which is an aside, the overnight stays, of course, over two days, you could actually process some of that difficult stuff. But on a two hour visit, we, as we've heard, with many people watching, no privacy, and often maybe you've been driven by the grudging neighbor or whatever, so you can't even really speak freely. It's just not going to happen. Um, so there's a lot to say and not much time to say it, so I'll, I'll move on. What I wanted to do really was to just try and introduce you to different young people who I encountered during this project. Um, older children, younger children, and show you some of their pictures. And I wanted to conclude by just sharing with you some of the Swedish young people um, and what they said at our last meeting. They talked very much about their rights and about how their rights, which obviously is the whole point of this conference and we've touched on this, 
but they very eloquently expressed how they felt that as children of prisoners, the rights they had under the UN Convention just weren't adhered to. Um, so, talked about coping project. Um, this, the, one of the things that we were most proud of for the, during the coping project was that we managed to facilitate two young people from Manchester to come to Geneva and address the UN Convention on the Rights, well, sorry, the UN Committee on the Rights of a Child, when they had a day of discussion um, around, it was called Children of Incarcerated Parents. But Raheel, who we won't mind me naming him because he wanted to be, he wanted to stand out and um, say, look, I'm, I want to tell other young people about my experience and policy makers and raise awareness. He said, when we asked him about coping, what's it meant for you? It's meant getting through a tough time in my life. That tough time has been from the moment my father was sentenced, as I've continually adapted to changes in my life. And what he meant, apart from other things, was each new prison, like his dad was on remand, and then he got used to strange ways in Manchester, and then his dad was transferred on to Risley Prison, which is in Cheshire, whole new set of rules, and obviously the transfers happen without notice. So just as he thought he was getting used to something, then it all changed. And um, they'd get on visits, and you were allowed some things, and you weren't allowed other things. So it was constant change and constant stress. Um, I won't say too much about um, the coping projects, I've sort of headlined it, but one of the great strengths of it was that we partnered an academic institution with an NGO, and in our case, we had um, Partners of Prisoner Support Service in Manchester, was the NGO, who run a lot of prison visits centres around Manchester, and around Cheshire, and in other places. And the great thing there was that we did quite a few interviews where we had a worker from POPs and then someone like myself, a researcher from a university. And that meant that the children who were interviewed would share the, what could be very vulnerable um, material, but then they'd make a link with the POPs worker. So a POPs worker would say, well look, if you're upset on visits, just tap me on the shoulder and I'll know what you mean and we'll have some time. And I think it's a fantastic model for research because you know, your worry as a researcher as you go in, and obviously you refer to a support organisations, etc. but to have somebody who's going to be there on a visit, so there's something very tangible for the young person from it. Um, yeah, I, I won't go too much into the detail, except to say, we're basically a thousand young people um, completed surveys in the four European countries, and about 50 young people in each country were interviewed in depth, as, along with their parents, um, both the imprisoned parent and the parent came from the community. So background information, I don't really want to say too much about this, I think it's been covered, but this, we've touched on this already, that <coughs> children describe the loss of a parent to prison as a bereavement, but it's a bereavement that there's no sympathy for, you know, it's not a bereavement you can share with anyone, and we know that one of the problems is that children, the prisoners, don't ask for support because they're too worried about the stigma, and rightly so. The 19-year-old the who you heard on the audio extract, she was pelted with rotten tomatoes with chance of murderer, murderer outside her school gates. So stigma is absolutely there and um, not to be underestimated. Some of the commentators talk about ambiguous loss and when children aren't given a proper explanation of what's happened to their parent, um, there's this idea that everything becomes vague, so the whole world becomes vague. They don't know where a parent is, can they trust other adults in their life? So the consequences for all the children of not being truthful can be quite profound. And as we know, the more serious the offence, the more stigma is attached. So some quotes here, you know, um, children become very good at suppressing things. And this idea, this is somebody in Germany who said, you know, we suddenly have a flaw which we're not responsible for. If we go into public with that flaw, and somehow they feel marked by the offence um, of perhaps a father in that case. Um, I mean, key findings of coping. Yes, we found that children were significantly at greater risk of experiencing mental health problems. Children who had parents in prison compared to those who didn't. Open communication is absolutely important, so a proper explanation was hugely important to their resilience. Um, as we've heard already, positive prison visiting is very important. Telephone contact, very important, often happening daily, if not twice daily. Schools have a wonderful role they can play. We heard about very good practice in schools. 
where teachers were really on the ball, and very bad practice in schools where teachers actually um, you know, punished children by referring to the fact that their father was in prison. Um, but um, I won't dwell on that too much. Stability, in terms of resilience factors, as ever, it varies from child to child. Um, yes, you know, stable home environment, good quality visits, and also good quality portrayal of the imprisoned parent is very important too. Two minutes. Right, I'm going to have to cut on. All right. Um, let me just cut to the chase, really. Um, this was done by Sean, who was the other young person who went to Geneva. She, on the, she did this in a collage with tissue paper. The left-hand side is her life torn up, ripped to pieces when her dad went to prison. But then she talked about how there was some order that came out of it, so this strips her order. But very wisely she said, but the order, there's, a, there's a lack of spontaneity. Yes, there's order, but I have to go every week to visit. And she was delighted to do it, and she gave up her social life. But there was no chance to do the spontaneous things. Um, right. Oh yes, I'm Sandy. There's telepathy going on here because I have to. Sean told me that um, in the prison visits area, in the very yes category C prison, her dad was held in, just tables. But then one day, a prison officer was chucking out a sofa, and he he decided to put it in the visits area and, as a privilege, allow men and their children, but not their partners, to sit on it. And she said it made such a difference. This tatty old sofa just transformed her visits. So she was saying small changes, big impact, absolutely. But, you know, this just gives you an insight into what children are faced with. This was a seven-year-old boy, and I really will be quick for them, I promise. You know, they just say, ha, 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 your dad's in prison, yours is a stupid life. You know, it was so, I don't know, just so you can just imagine that chant in the playground. And then he's conflicted. He's thinking, actually, it's his fault he's there. He got himself in there. It's his fault. It's no one else's fault. And this is a picture that he drew me. And he, his dad, he imagined that his dad was lying under a cage. And he told me that the cage had electric, it was like, he imagined it like a kind of cackle fence. So that if his dad touched those bars, he'd be electrocuted. And he said, you know, they have to do that to restrain my dad. And I say, no, no, they don't do that. Oh, yes, they do. But we heard stories of children who felt their parents were chained to walls, like in Robin Hood, with rats nibbling their toes. But this was because no, they, there's so little information about prisons. And one of the things the Swedish people, Swedish young people said, which I can't come on to, was, you know, we need to have a routine um, dissemination of a real-life um, portrayal of prisons. So yes, of course they're negative places. Yes, of course they're not nice places for violence. But there's a positive side. People do develop, people do computer courses or other things. So they said it would make a huge difference to them to know that the prison isn't all bad. They also said many other things which I can't go into because I'm going to encroach on other people's time. So um, thank you very much for listening.